after 2.30. So for the second interview, we will have to move to the elementary school. Okay? We sincerely apologize. Yeah. So many of you don't understand why we have two locations, and I just want to make sure that we're clear about that. And so we, we will finish on time, and then we'll walk over to the elementary school. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. So today, the, the format is, is very casual. Um, this is the second time that Ellen, this is Ellen, and um, she, she, this morning she had a session in Kudomo Radio. So she's familiar with the way that we do things, so we call it meet and greet. What that means is that, you know, we have a very manageable audience group here. So what we'll do, we'll have give Ellen a little bit of time to, to introduce herself, and um, we'll pretty much open up the floor for your questions. And I'll be facilitating, I'll make sure that, you know, um, we ask questions and we finish precisely by 2.30 or 2.25. Okay? All right. All right, I'll, I'll turn the floor to Ellen. Do I really need this? Can you hear me without it? Can you all hear me? Yes. 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 some of you and to uh, be considered uh, uh, as a candidate to be the interim superintendent uh, here at SAS. Um, I, if you were a little smaller, I would try to find out who you are, but let me start by introducing uh, myself a little bit. You may have seen my uh, uh, CV, my resume, it's been a little unusual. Um, first of all, my background is in private independent schools. I have never been in an American public school. Uh, I had a wonderful career uh, in, in independent schools, and I was in one school in New York City um, for on and off for about 40 years. Uh, that may seem a little odd to you, it is an unusual career. But each time I thought about doing something else, a new job kind of dropped into my hands. And so I started there as a ninth grade student, graduated, went off to university, began to teach math, came back as a math teacher. Uh, I eventually, I was the head of the middle school, seventh and eighth grade, then I was assistant principal, and then I was principal. And that period spanned about 40 years, and uh, with it included uh, an 11-year maternity leave. Uh, I did not have elephants, but I did have four children. <laughs> <laughs> so I did spend uh, a lot of work part-time uh, for, for 10 or 11 years before I came back, uh, came back to teaching. Um, I then had the opportunity to be the head of school at a school for girls in Philadelphia. Philadelphia had a strong tradition of, of uh, women's education for little girls and young women, and it was a very important time for me. I spent five years there, uh, and I really enjoyed having the opportunity to think just about what works for little girls and young women. And we did a lot of things that were different uh, in that school uh, in terms of the opportunities we gave to the girls, the uh, things we, uh, we pushed for them, the leadership opportunities, but also opportunities to uh, play with blocks, to uh, design projects. I was uh, on the other campus, they were building the pyramids. They were building a pyramid over there, and it reminded me of a project we did in third or fourth grade where we handed groups, three girls, groups of three girls, a stack of newspapers and a roll of tape. And we said, your job in the next three days is to build a structure big enough for one of you to get in. And that was very challenging for them. It took quite a while before they figured out you had to roll up the newspaper to create poles to hold a, a firm structure. But giving them opportunities to do things in three dimensions um, was, was part of, of the training that we, uh, that we did. So it was, 
it was a really interesting time for me. Uh, and then I went overseas for the first time, and uh, as the director of the Anglo-American School in Moscow. And that was a school that was 50 years old, but had, it was 1996, it was shortly after Perestroika, and the school had grown rapidly the last few years, and they had just graduated only two classes uh, at that time. Uh, so they had added grades 10, 11, and 12, not unlike uh, this school has done uh, as well. And while I was, I was in Moscow, I was in Moscow for eight years, we built the new campus for the Anglo-American School. We built a, a $45 million campus for 1,200 students. And uh, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience and a wonderful opportunity to build the school of your dreams, to use all the, the things that had worked and not worked in buildings you'd been in and put them together limited piece of property with a limited budget, but it was, it was uh, a, a real, an exciting journey and a challenging one uh, in Moscow at that time. Uh, and then I started uh, to do interim jobs. It's strange that uh, there is a job, that there is a need for that, but there is. And uh, since that time, I've, I've gone uh, over the last nine years I've been in seven schools in different countries, different parts of the world, uh, for mostly for one year, but twice for two years. Uh, I worked in uh, Eastern Europe, I worked in Europe, I worked in Guatemala, I worked in Mumbai, uh, I worked in, uh, now in, in Vietnam, in Ho Chi Minh City. So it's been, a, it's been a wonderful journey. Uh, when you come into a school as an interim, it's, it's a different job from coming in as, as a permanent uh, superintendent. Uh, it's not, uh, I always come in as if I'm going to stay there forever. You, you have to do that. No school stands still. You have to come in and take the school. You have to be a quick study because you have to figure out the <coughs> school, the culture, the needs. You have to know what the um, values are and you have to know what, the, what things they're working on uh, that you can help them move forward. And if the something is underway that you think you can improve or uh, add to, value to, uh, then you have the opportunity to do that. If, if you find that um, there's something you have grave reservations about, uh, then you, you gently try to uh, bring them out to talk to people to see what kind of interest there is in doing something differently. Um, but you don't initiate major change unless A, the community, the administration is, uh, is behind it, and second of all, if the new superintendent has been chosen, uh, is also on board with moving in that direction. Otherwise, people will say, well, why should we do this, because the next guy in is, or woman is going to just go in a different direction. In some schools, the, the permanent head of school has been chosen before I have gotten there, and in some cases the search has been done while, while I've been there. So it's, I've worked both ways. And of course one of your jobs as a, an interim uh, superintendent is to try to make as smooth a transition as you can for uh, the new person coming in. Person's usually in a position of responsibility in another school, has a full time job someplace else uh, to run for that year, and, and the board has entrusted you with the, the leadership of this, this school for the year that you're here, uh, and that's an important, important role to fill. 
So for me, um, each time that I've, I've gone into a school, and I've worked in schools, um, I've not worked in a school as big as SAS, but I've worked in schools with 1,200 students, and I've worked in a school with 150 students from three-year-olds to 12th grade. In a way, the job is the same, regardless of the size of the school. In some ways, uh, being in a small school is more difficult than being in a big school. In a big school, you have a very competent administrative team uh, behind you. And when I was in the school with 150 kids, I was the uh, I was the director, I was the high school principal, I was the college counselor, <laughs> I was the admissions director, I was the s in charge of security, <laughs> I was the lunch lady. <laughs> I delivered the lunches to the three-year-olds through first grade every day, and then went around squeezing ketchup on whatever they wanted me to squeeze ketchup on. Uh, and then in Poland, they put ketchup on everything, including pizza. It uh, was quite a shock. Uh, but uh, it was a wonderful year. I, I had a wonderful year. And uh, when I left, and they were doing a nice little good goodbye book, and some of the students and faculty were writing things. And one of the grade, first grade decided that I was the queen of ketchup. <laughs> and uh, that's been one of my favorite titles, uh, the uh, honors that I have, uh, have won. Um, so it's, uh, it's, you know, you, when, you, when you come in, um, the board will have a mandate for you. They will know the issues that they uh, want you to focus on. The administration will have uh, their needs. Uh, you hope they're the same. Uh, if not, you, you have to uh, juggle them and set some priorities. Uh, and uh, each, each position that I've been in uh, has been different, and there have been different needs. Um, but it's, it's been uh, uh, really very interesting work. Uh, and it, it gives you an appreciation for, uh, it gives you the opportunity to live uh, in different places and to work with different people. Uh, when I went to India, to Mumbai, I wasn't in the American School of Bombay, I was in an all Indian, an, an Indian all IB school, school that ran the primary and middle years program and the diploma program. Uh, and it was a new school, it was just in its second year when I got there. But virtually all the students were Indian, and virtually all the staff was Indian. And so that was, for me, uh, an interesting experience to work uh, entirely, uh, almost entirely, with host country uh, nationals. And uh, so that was, uh, and many, some of the other schools I've been in, of course, have had the combination of uh, students, families that are permanent or long-term or local uh, residents, uh, and those that are transitioning uh, in and out. And I didn't have to begin that transitioning myself to understand how the needs of those two groups of people uh, are different in some ways, and how a school has to serve all of them. And that there have to be, uh, has to be give and take, there have to be compromises, but in terms of leadership, uh, your goal is to make the school work for everyone and ensure that all the families, the students and the families, um, feel that the school is, is uh, their school, that they feel ownership in the school, even if they're only there for two or three years and coming and going. But you also begin to understand the stresses that puts on families who are in transition, <clears throat> both in terms of the students uh, and in terms of, of the parents in those schools, and particularly the non-working partner. Uh, when a family moves on a temporary or short-term assignment to a country, um, on the whole, the, the working partner is fine. He or she goes to work, uh, you have a 
community, you have a group of people, you have a job to do, you have people around to help you get acclimated to the culture, to the company, uh, or the embassy, or whatever it is. Um, the kids on the whole do fine also. Uh, it's a little harder for teenagers than for uh, younger children as you move because of the uh, importance of their friends that they, that they lead. Um, but kids know how to do school. So they move into the school and usually they're, they're quite comfortable quite quickly. The hardest person is if there is a non-working spouse uh, or partner who, who needs doesn't have an automatic community unless the school itself uh, provides it, unless the parents of the school um, provide support for those new families coming in and for, uh, to be there uh, for them and to provide them support and help and advice. How to do, where to go and how to do things in that new, in that new environment. Um, so the work for me has been uh, Exciting. It's been interesting, um, and uh, looking forward to to continue. On. So much. Uh, I don't know if that's enough. Maybe I'll stop and let you uh, ask some questions. Uh, anything's fair game. Great. So thanks to Helen. Yes. And um, I guess we just feel free to you know ask questions. Well, I'm also curious because I had heard that you were going to superintendent of the year just recently, but I wasn't clear on, you know, and this is why other superintendents at a meeting, so I was just wondering, you know, you know, for a superintendent of the year, what, <coughs> what are the, the, what meeting was it, and what, what, what? <laughs> it was, um, a school a, 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 basically a, a surprise, and I thought undeserved, but there's, there's an association called the, uh, in, in the states called the Association for the Advancement of Intellect, International Education, AAIE. And they have a, a, a procedure for selecting a superintendent each year. And so there, there's a criteria and somebody nominates and people support the nomination and the board decides. Um, that's the plus side. It was a great honor, and I haven't been in the international schools as long as many of uh, uh, other superintendents and school heads, directors have been. Um, but there was a downside to it, and that was that you had to give a 40-minute distinguished lecture at the conference to about 450 people. And uh, so that was enough to make me quite nervous uh, for a long time until I got that written and uh, delivered. Uh, so it, it was indeed uh, a very happy time. And, uh, thank you. Next question. challenges when you go into different schools. Um, but as an interim, you usually go into a crisis situation. Uh, illness, death, um, uh, a difference, uh, disagreement between the school board and the head of school, sometimes quite late in the year. Uh, so that there's not time to pick a new, to run a proper search. Uh, sometimes the search hasn't turned out well. The candidates, the finalist candidates have come in and then they decide that none of them fits the bill or they take jobs someplace else. So you, you go into a crisis situation and the, um, of some sort. Doesn't mean the school's running badly or anything like that, but there's conflict. Um, and so the first thing <coughs> that you have to do basically is to bring stability to the school. Uh, you know, for people to re 
recognize that you're there, you're there to do a job, you're going to do it, you have the experience to do it, and the board has <coughs> confidence in you to do it. Um, and I've been in, in situations where, uh, uh, well, last year in, in uh, I was at the higher <laughs> American college, it was not it was the year after Mubarak uh, stepped down. Uh, it was um, uh, there was a huge evacuation the year before, the spring before. It was enormously disruptive. Uh, people were just coming back together. They were uh, anxious about the continuing political instability, and they wanted to ensure that a campus was safe. Safety was a big issue. Um, and second of all, that should there be a disruption of services again, that the school, the students could continue to be educated. So we needed to ensure that every teacher's work was on Moodle, that every student and every parent knew how to access it, and then Things were being kept up to date on it, and uh, then we had uh, we actually practiced it with a virtual school day, in which we it was a legal school day, but the kids did not come to school. The teachers could come to school or not. Many lived within walking distance, mostly within walking distance of the school, so they could be home. Or the kids had to check in. They had to between nine and three. They had to do assigned work in each of their classes and, and so forth. And uh, having brainstormed it, we, we picked up a few problems. We, uh, the main problem was that um, the teachers gave too much work to the elementary school students who needed their parents' help, a parent or an adult or an older sibling, helping them with it. And uh, so some of them had to spend uh, too long sitting in front of their computers. But we learned from that, and the next time we did it, it went more smoothly. So there have been different kinds of issues in different, in different settings that, that we've got work with enrollment issues, I've worked with budget issues, um, we worked with personnel issues where one had to make some changes in personnel, and coming in as an interim, you can, you can do that, um, and perhaps allow the permanent person coming in after you to have a clearer path forward. Next question, um, over here first, and then there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned one of the key responsibility of the interim superintendents to just was the transition. Well, I have a question regarding legacy, or ensuring legacy, as you know, I say, has to celebrate the uh, centennial Last year. So, do you see any skills, any things that you, as an interim superintendent, could do to possibly have any impact on ensuring the legacy of the ICS uh, or has a negative? Well, I probably don't have enough information about it. But one thing about a legacy is keeping in touch with the students who have come through the school. Not necessarily graduated, because of course the school hasn't had many graduating classes, relatively speaking, to the 100 years or the 70 years it was operating. But going out to find those alumni, trying to reconnect them with the school, trying to get their stories. One, one thing about the independent schools is that they keep wonderful archives, and girls' schools in particular are wonderful. Um, but the history of the school, of each school, is unique and um, treasure, should be treasured. And uh, going back and having some time, having an historian, sometimes a volunteer, who has some experience with that and trying to get in touch with people from former years is, is, uh, might be uh, something which it hasn't, if it hasn't been done. Yes. 
so it was an easy one. Thank you. Yeah, I saw that you almost injured. So well, I'm not on the plane. <laughs> I had a little fall about six weeks ago, and I'm hoping to get this off soon. children. They're all grown now with children of their own. I have eight grandchildren. Um, when I first was thinking about going overseas um, in 1996, um, I had an elderly father and uh, we were worried about him and one of my sons said that he would, he would take care of him uh, Well, if I went. And uh, Unfortunately, he died about 10 days before I went out to Moscow. My mother had passed away earlier. But the kids said, my children said, wait a minute, they said, and actually they've been quite thrilled to have me doing this kind of work, but they said, children are supposed to leave their mothers. Mothers aren't supposed to leave their children. <laughs> but they have uh, been very supportive and have come and, and visited me when they could with their families, occasionally without. Um, it's hard to pick up each year and to move. Uh, just physically, it's hard. It's it's uh, um, you have to be kind of uh, flexible and a little bit low key, uh, which I am about accommodations and what I eat. I mean, I can always find good food wherever I am. I, I don't have to have certain things uh, to keep me going. Um, you worry about. I was I was saying to somebody, the first thing you have to figure out in in many places is the kissing culture. Is it one, two, or three? And I've been in communities where it was one, or two, or three. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about it is this, that you, you really make friends wherever you go, and you take them with you. So I am still in contact, good friends, with people in each of those interim positions. And some of them have been you know, easier than others. Um, some of them, the, usually the administration is, are the first people that reach out to you to help you settle in and, and usually become your closest friends. But that's not always so. And when you've got 150 kids and you're basically the administration with one assistant, you know, that, then you, you spend quite a bit of time alone. Um, but you, as I said, you, you, you uh, um, uh, there are for that, which is the, the interest and the pleasure of being in, in different places and being different people. Uh, um, Al, I'm very curious, because uh, I know you're a Harvard alum and you have children who are also Harvard alum. Does the, I mean, I think a, a lot of parents are concerned at the high school level about college preparatory, but does that consideration start, I mean, how early does that start? being very clear. I, I actually have four children, all of whom went to Ivy League colleges. Each of them went to an Ivy League college. Um, going to an Ivy League college does not ensure a good education. A good education, I think only, don't tell that if you ever meet okay. <laughs> But I think only one of the four got a really good education. And I won't tell you which college she went to, those colleges she went to. Um, but uh, it was because she worked hard and she was interested. And, um, uh, you know, name brand colleges are just that, but they're not, they're not necessarily the place where your child or my children would get the best education. And I, I think you really have to be clear about what a good education is, and I think SAS needs to be clear, and perhaps it is clear. But a good school is educating children not for university, but for life. And there's a big difference uh, in that. Uh, I think you all want 
your children to be happy and successful. Um, and that includes a great deal more than getting good grades uh, or going to a name brand college. One of the things I particularly value about Saigon South International School in Ho Chi Minh City, which is where I am now, is they have an unusual set of core values. 